right. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our Race Equity Month webinar. It's the first of three webinars that we'll be having throughout this month. Um, I'm going to hand over to Charmaine Bynes, who will be facilitating for the hour. Thank you. Thank you, Adago, for the introduction. And uh, a very warm welcome to each and every one of you. I believe we have uh, something in the region of 95 of you on who have booked onto this webinar, which is really fantastic uh, and shows that you know you are as committed as we are uh, towards the topic, which is, as Adalgo said, is the first in the Race Equity Month series. And this is building a culturally competent curriculum. As you are aware from Twitter and the website, the council's website, that we will be, we've planned a lot of activity uh, for November on our Race Equity Month. So please, please make sure you keep your eye out and engage with this very important month. I'm truly delighted to have been asked to facilitate this webinar today. And my name is Charmaine Barnes, as you can see on the screen. Uh, I am Associate Pro Vice Chancellor and Executive Dean of the College of Nursing, Midwifery and Health at the University of West London. I'm also, I'm actually very honoured to be the Chair of the Council of Deans for Health Anti-Racism Advisory Group. And it's just really for information and awareness that this group has been established by the Council and reflects its commitment to anti-racism within healthcare academia for both staff and for students. The group comprises healthcare academics and students, and our role is to really support and promote diversity and inclusion, our anti-racist practices, and equity in the work that we do. Our role is also to advise the organization that is the Council of Deans for Health on integrating this particular agenda across its policy and leadership work. I really hope today's event is going to be of great value to all of you, um, because I, my personal feeling is that inclusion and inclusivity should not just be a buzzword in the world of higher education. It really needs to be the cornerstone of our working practices right from the leadership teams and academic teams that we recruit through to how we learn, how we teach you, what we learn, and what support we actually offer you as staff and students to enable this teaching and learning to take place. I think it also lends a focus on equality and equity, which is really important to maximize individual potential and to raise aspiration and fulfill ambition. So today we are joined, I'm very excited about this, by three wonderful speakers who are very eminent in our world. And we have got, the person who's going to go first is Kamini Gadok, MBE, Chief Executive Officer, Royal College of Speech and Language, Language Therapists. Kamini, thank you for joining us. Followed by Dr. Keelan, Kean Lim, Council Member, Royal College of Occupational Therapists and Admissions Tutor and Lecturer in Occupational Therapy, Brunel University. And last but not least, Chelsea Beckford Project, Student Midwife, University of Bedfordshire, and a current student on the Student Leadership Programme. Before I hand over to our speakers, just a bit of housekeeping to say to all participants that please do engage with this event by asking questions of the panelists using the question and answer function. You are able to use the chat function to speak with other participants, but please note that this will not be monitored. Your question and answers will be followed up by council members who are on this call. Please also note that the webinar will be recorded and will be available after the event. So our running order is Kamini, followed by Kian, and then followed by Chelsea. So without further ado, may I please hand over to Kamini? Thank you. 
thank you so much, Charmaine. And I think um, colleagues at the Council of Deans are going to help share my slide presentation. So I'll hand over to you just to share that if that's okay. Perfect. I'll just put it up on the screen now for you. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. It's been a, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, before we start, I thought it'd be really helpful just to highlight where we came from in terms of our journey. So next slide, please. Thank you. So the start of the journey, where did it begin and what are our aims? I think as for many of us, since May 2020, spurred on by the international outcry over the murder of George Floyd, and our members' clear calls for action, the RCSLT has fully committed to embed anti-racism across the speech and language therapy profession. We have seen that despite all our past work, because we have been working on areas um, on this area for many years, things really hadn't changed nearly quickly enough. And we needed to have a fresh approach as a result, we've opened a, a, a group to all members. It's called the Anti-Racism Reference Group. And we've been working with members to help shape ideas together. To start with, and as we go forward, the main thing that we're doing is listening to our members. And it's been really critical that we do listen, either through the group itself, but also through social media, and have the opportunity through the group and through other opportunities that we have with contact with members to have some deep conversations about experiences and frustrations. I must admit that I was truly shocked by what I, by what I heard last year and the racism experienced by our members, both as students, but also as practicing speech therapists, particularly colleagues that identified as black and from African Caribbean backgrounds. All the experiences we heard about told us that there are no easy answers. Racism and inequality are entrenched in our society, in our institutions, in universities, in the NHS, and in other organizations. So it's clear that we need to take action on many fronts at once. Next slide, please. So this shows that whilst we were, were looking at um, building a culturally competent profession, we know that there are other elements that we need to also focus on. So our work is looking at uh, the diversity of the profession itself, uh, the leadership within the RCSLT, both in terms of its governance and how we engage with members to, uh, to develop a more diverse um, leadership structure within the RCSLT. And we're doing a lot of work on that, which is really positive. So with respect to building a culture competent profession for the future starts, as we know, with supporting our students and our approach has three aspects, addressing the individual and their cultural values and beliefs and embedding EDI and anti-racism into the work we do to support our profession who already provide care to our populations. We're really concerned that we don't have a situation where the students might be learning one thing, but the clinicians who are already practicing are on a, at a different place. So it's really that parallel work stream that is critical to us. We've been working with our members, including our students, to be actively anti-racist through a program of learning. And that's included online resources. We've held some events and we're developing reading and other opportunities. So for example, we had our conference last month and we had some keynote speakers who were talking on this issue. We've also worked very closely with our HEIs around supporting diversity in the workforce and looking to work with them about how we can continue to look at the curricula and promote cultural competence through that. And I'm going to go on to that through the next few slides. So next slide, please. So I mentioned the importance of supporting our current um, uh, practitioners to meet the needs of diverse populations. As I said, we've already had work uh, and resources that have been developed and are already on our websites, for example, our guidance on bilingualism. However, we've identified that there is still much to do, as I said, in terms of looking at how members really understand what that means for them in terms of providing high quality care. Uh, one element that we've really focused on is around health inequality. So, so uh, supporting members to do a self audit tool. So we've only just published this guidance and it's the aim of it, which is to help services to look at 
how they are identifying their local populations, by the diversity and health inequalities of those local populations, looking at how they break down barriers for access and supporting uh, services to think about and look at the appropriateness of the services that they provide. And that includes um, looking at language, uh, religion and cultural needs and being very embracing of those requirements. So we're very keen that our ex clinical excellence networks, as they're called, work very closely with our universities. So the clinical excellence networks are where our members uh, really go to for CPD, uh, so that they can actually work with the universities to look at particular clinical areas. And here's a screenshot that shows, for example, uh, uh, an event that happened around eating, drinking and swallowing needs and how to make sure that food modification takes account of those cultural differences. So um, going on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, what we've done from the beginning is really to see how we can facilitate conversations within universities themselves. And we brought a group of universities together and we help them to engage with other colleagues and experts in South Africa to support the learning and lessons from each other. Um, and this is something that's been really helpful to see how can we look outside of our own country, what's happening in other countries, how do we support that learning? And there is a momentum that's been building from these discussions about a shared agenda for change. So I'm not gonna go through all of the issues that have been raised so far, but you can see from the slide that there's been an, uh, you know, the, the need to look at the curriculum in a different way in terms of how it's reviewed, the importance of weaving in new structures, competencies and constructs, and looking at the aim of teaching to raise a collective consciousness and awareness to develop an inclusive and socially just practitioner. We're now working to bring colleagues back together um, across a larger group of universities with us as RCSLT staff to see what they've been doing, what they've been learning by talking to their colleagues in South Africa and to really see how we can move forward from those sorts of conversations. Next slide, please. We've recently just done a survey of our universities. 50% um, of them responded to the survey to ask them what they've been doing. Again, just to get a picture of where they are now uh, on this journey and how we can support shared learning. So I'm not going to go through all the boxes on this slide, but just some key things I think you should just to, to highlight to all of you who are listening, the importance of looking at teaching about structural racism, discrimination, intersectionality and allyship, looking at how assignments and research can focus on cultural and diversity, so using things that we would be expecting students to do anyway to support them in their learning, thinking about discussions around cultural and linguistic materials that are, that are appropriate, but other areas which I think is, are really critical, like working across faculties to reduce the attainment gap between BAME and white students and between students from disadvantaged and more advantaged backgrounds. Next slide, please. So this is the final slide, which again is uh, from the survey results, asking universities what they're doing. And it's really good to know that they're listening to students, whether that's through specific, specific forums or focus groups, but also individual sessions for students to reflect on their own values and their, the importance of cultural, what we're calling cultural inquisitiveness. So thinking about how they approach um, understanding and developing their own understanding and not stereotyping people. I think that's been a really key point of our conversations that, you know, you can't make assumptions about anyone, but having that cultural inquisitiveness will help you to identify the needs of your individual uh, families that you work with, uh, without provide, you know, without creating a stereotypical approach to meeting needs. Um, also, as you can see from this slide, the importance of CPD sessions and establishing systems such as mentoring for students of colour. So I hope that's given you a helpful overview. And the next step, as I said before, is to bring universities together to share some of that learning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kamini. I'm going to move straight over to Kian. Hello, everybody. Uh, just give me a moment to get to my slides and I shall share it and I'll go from there. Uh, just give me, okay, good. So hopefully you can see these slides. Um, so as uh, 
I've been introduced. My name is Kiel, and I am one of the lecturers at Brunel University, but I'm also the vice chair uh, of the Royal College of Occupational Therapists and also the International Officer and uh, World Federation Occupational Therapy UK delegate. And I'll explain why that's relevant uh, as I go through the slides. So uh, the first thing I want to do is to just give you a little bit of a perspective or overview of uh, the Royal College of Occupational Therapists. Uh, and I think one of the things that probably has already been mentioned is that uh, recent events of the last year, year and a half has really caused everybody to uh, reflect and to consider. And this is the same thing with the Royal College of Occupational Therapists. I think we have gone through a process of really uh, being uh, transparent about the shortcomings that uh, you know, we have within the profession in terms of addressing issues around uh, racism, around institutional um, racism, around uh, cultural diversity and equality and so on. And uh, I think it's, it's been a really helpful, although sometimes difficult situation to be in, but a ne very necessary situation to be in where we've really looked at a whole range of things within the whole college and the practices, the policies, um, the historical uh, ways things were done and whether they are really appropriate, they're really uh, right or, or the way forward. So uh, we've been looking at things around systemic racism, looking at examining the organizational culture and where that needs to change, uh, looking at issues around quality, uh, diversity, and of course, uh, not only inclusion, but also influence. Um, and with the educational programs, we have a kind of, I guess, two prone level. So we have what we call the World Federation in Occupational Therapists, and they have set some standards. And these standards apply to all uh, programs across uh, not only the UK, but across the world that want to get accreditation. Uh, and they have to meet these professional uh, and educational standards within all the delivery of all the programs they uh, provide in educating new students. So among these standards are, are rules and guidelines and uh, um, outlines of certain things that you need to abide by, that you need to keep to. So for example, in uh, there is a diversity and cultural kind of guiding principles document that uh, requires us to much, uh, very much focus on if you are in education, these are the particular things you need to be looking at, addressing, focusing on. If you are a service provider, these are the particular things you need to be paying attention to. Uh, and if you are a clinician, these are the things that you need to be considering in your practice, in your service, and so on. Uh, and the range of issues in it could be things around human rights, racism, it could be about equity, it could be around how you're addressing issues around dark culture and diversity uh, and inclusion and so on. And then within the Royal College of Occupational Therapists, we also have some learning and development standards that are uh, produced. And those standards are for many of the document, uh, sorry, many of the organizations, especially the educational uh, uh, providers within universities and so on to look at how are they delivering the education? What are they focusing on? What are they uh, needing to do more of? Uh, where is the direction of travel that we should be heading for? And of course, these standards, uh, these learning and development standards include things around uh, cultural diversity. It looks at cultural competence, it looks at uh, issues around cultural safety, um, and so on. Uh, RCOT is, as I said, um, together with the World Federation, focused on the kind of professional standards. So looking at the code of practice that we have, do they fall in with what we are recognizing as important things to focus on? Um, not just in terms of how we treat patients, but actually, how are we interacting with our peers? Um, 
and, and so on, how we engaging with our students and so on. So the, the Royal College has uh, recently appointed a uh, EDI officer and uh, we haven't had one. And it's a real uh, achievement, I think, that we have now appointed someone and it is by no means the role of the EDI officer to take the whole agenda forward. I think there is recognition within the whole organization that this is not just the, uh, you know, the role and, and, and task of one person, but the whole organization needs to work towards making uh, this a real agenda issue in every aspect of what we do. So there is a commitment to looking not just reviewing, examining, but also looking at all the policies, the standards, the practices that we produce and to see whether they uh, reflect the shift in um, direction that we wanna take. So within the scope of uh, what's, what's going forward for RCOT, of course, we are looking at issues around leadership and management, and how inclusive they are. So the HB, I know that there is a recent document that highlighted that there are many uh, BME, uh, um, you know, uh, professionals that don't make their way to the top of the professions and to the top of roles within the HS. And they're kind of restricted in terms of their ability to achieve those uh, Ben 8, Ben 9 or Ben 7 roles even. So what can we do about that? Uh, looking at mentoring junior staff, especially staff from underrepresented groups, uh, looking at uh, how do we uh, ensure that the profession is opening itself up, not just merely in terms of widening participation, but also how are we drawing in uh, unrepresented groups from particular uh, minority communities and, and so on. So what I wanted to do next is to share a little bit about my own experience and my experience at Brunel. So these are- and I'm sorry to interrupt, we're going to run out of time. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to carry on or do you want me to stop? Yeah, you may carry on, but I'm just saying you might need to make it succinct. Oh, no, no you... that's not a problem, that's not a problem. Okay, okay. thank you, to give so... Chelsea a chance. Yeah, no problem. So I think in terms of, I'll probably take 30 seconds to do this. So in terms of Brunel, no one of the things that we do is look at the emissions and look at the diversity and equality and how we're opening it up, how we're engaging with different minority community groups to draw maybe people uh, from those groups. We're looking at the diversity of the staff group that we have, how we're mentoring uh, new staff and new people who might be interested in coming to teach at, uni at the university. We have a race culture equality lead that takes the agenda forward in terms of making sure that we are always focused on the particular issues. And we're having frank and honest discussions with our students and staff around racism, discrimination, uh, looking at cultural diversity, looking at program design, looking at cultural competence and safety in the curriculum, looking at issues around power privilege or decolonizing the curriculum, like, you know, who are we inviting as speakers? Are there alternative perspectives? I'll be looking at the read, reading list. Do they represent any particular groups from particular backgrounds? Uh, and then looking at some of the kind of placement issues that often happen. So sometimes, you know, some students from particular backgrounds actually all the struggle on placement. What is the issue around that? Uh, and is some discrimination going on? Looking at tack tackling the awarding gaps of students from particular backgrounds, like we have been. Uh, and also looking at uh, enhancing the influence of the local community. So drawing the local community groups uh, into teaching the students about particular things, about the cultural skills and so on. Uh, and lastly, we have a very active uh, society of students who uh, form the Brunel OT Society. And they have done a, uh, introduced a cultural journal, a journal club where they're looking at particular articles from different backgrounds, having, having that discussion. Uh, and also getting the student conference. So we have an annual student conference where we actually invite a whole range of uh, speakers that might not be reflective of our staff group because maybe it's uh, you know in a particular uh, makeup, but that allows more alternative views to be brought in to benefit the students in their learning. Uh, and that's actually 
Oh, I was going to say. <laughs> so hopefully that'll be fine. Thank you. No problem. Thank you very much. And without further ado, I am going to hand over to Chelsea. Thank you, Charmaine. Um, I'll just quickly share my Okay, so um, I'm, my name is Chelsea. I am a uh, third year student midwife at the uh, University of Bedfordshire. I'm also a hypnobirthing practitioner and um, with the company that I trained with, which is the Little Birth Company, I've also taken on the role as um, uh, the peer anti-racism educator. I'm a member of the two, uh, 2021 cohort of 150 leaders and one of my passions and one of my real aims and one of the main reasons why I wanted to become a midwife is to become um, an agent in change in reducing uh, the disparity um, of maternal mortality rates in the UK. So I went on a little journey um, to finding my voice and awakening the inner activist. Um, it was a combination of two things. Um, one was the Embrace Report, um, which I'm sure many of us have heard about um, within the maternity services. Um, and basically in the UK today, black women are four times more likely to die during pregnancy in the perinatal period. Um, women of mixed ethnicity are three times and Asian women are twice as likely to die than um, their white counterparts. And this is, well, it's, it's unacceptable really. Um, considering that the UK is one of the safest places in the world to give birth, um, these kind of disparities really, really need changing. Um, so in addition to uh, what other, some of the other speakers have mentioned is that last year was, it weighed very heavily on my heart, the um, events around George Floyd's death. And in not only that, but the case of the bird watcher in, in Central Park and um, Breonna Taylor, it was just, it just kept snowballing all these injustices and inequalities that we were seeing. Um, and it led me to contact my university lecturing team and ask, you know, <coughs> We don't really learn anything outside of what's in our textbooks, but we are going to be, once we're qualified, we are going to be uh, responsible for caring for women from a wide range of cultures, from a wide range of backgrounds. And I don't think we're fully prepared for that. There's so much that we don't understand and that we don't know and that we're not taught, basically. And I had a discussion with my lecturers and they encouraged me to actually write down my thoughts and feelings and that then became a um, an article that was published in the practicing midwife journal and i talked about the importance of decolonizing midwifery education so what does decolonizing education mean so it describes the academic movement across universities and other institutions to highlight inequalities resulting from historical colonial influences and to transform and modernize materials and i think that this is really really needed um, in midwifery education we focus mostly on one pelvic shape and that is despite the fact that um with even within certain populations the shape of maternal pelvises can vary widely we focus on um all our kind of sim models are of one particular skin color our pro formers even down to the pro formers that we fill out with regards to um baby observations it's always that the skin is the skin pink or is the baby pale obviously my baby would not have pink skin or my baby would not be pale. Um, so it's little things like that that really need kind of rethinking and reshaping. So within my article, I went on to um, talk about what students need in order to be kind of more well-rounded um, in order to go out into the world to be practicing midwives. And we need a knowledge of the history of obstetrics, of obstetrics and gynecology. Um, it's not 
pretty and we need to kind of face these facts even today we use the term sims position and we use the sims speculum and james marion sims who was known as the godfather of modern gynecology would perfect his techniques on enslaved women not not much is known about that not much is known about these women but his name kind of still lives on within the world of obstetrics and gynecology representation really matters as a black student um i am definitely one of the minority but not only that um the the communities that we serve are a lot more culturally diverse than our cohorts and so something needs to be looked at with regards to the recruitment um of of, of students as well and also the lecturing staff the academic staff um, even down to the kind of research that goes on within maternity i've had to kind of rethink my dissertation because looking for research where uh, women of uh, black caribbean or black african um, ethnicities are um, was what the information that i wanted to find there was just not enough for me to do that so even in the world of research um, there needs to be a lot more diversification so learning about um, learning that includes cultural competency and having an understanding of what racism is and also what it isn't and how we can be actively anti-racist as students. And in, coming into that is we also need a safe space to learn and grow because it's not always easy as a student in practice to um, not conf to confront things that we feel are not right. It's a lot easier to just keep quiet and just say, you know, well, I'm not going to do that. But the keeping quiet just helps to perpetuate this kind of culture that people don't feel like they can speak up. So why is cultural competence important? In the world of birth, women and birthing people need culturally competent carers because they can actually help to reduce cultural isolation, which may prevent some women from actually seeking services and um, accessing maternity services. And this can actually help reduce disparities in health. So I've got these two really good quotes. I won't read them both, but the first one I'll definitely read. So cultural competence relies on a strong foundation of knowledge about cultures. It allows the practitioner to appreciate, understand and empathize with the culture and as a result, deliver appropriate and effective healthcare through changes in both approach and technique. And I think this is a vitally important thing to, for us to grasp as students in that the way you approach one family is not the way you can approach another one. You have to kind of tailor your approach to things and having a, a, a knowledge base, even if it's a basic knowledge of this woman or birthing person's culture and beliefs um, it's Chelsea, really important. can only afford another minute, I'm afraid. No problem. Um, I'm, okay. I'm at the end. Thank you. So for students, we really need to think about how we become culturally competent allies. And I know the word ally is a bit of a buzzword, but it is really, really important. We need to educate ourselves. We need to feel safe enough to speak up diversifying our social media feeds. Social media is very um, popular among students. So diversifying the people that you read about and also the books that you read um, and understanding the importance of intersectionality with regards to maternity, intersectional, intersectional feminism and doing the work for the right reasons and using any privilege that you have for the benefit of others. Thank you, just some references there. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, all three of you. Uh, I'm sure you will all agree that it was really, really good to hear perspectives from, uh, you know, Tamani, who's clinically based. We've got Kian, who is, uh, you know, education provider, and Chelsea, who very, very um, effectively represented the student voice. Uh, so thank you to each and every one of you. I'm not going to do any questions for you because I think we might be we've overrun slightly and the webinar will finish at um, you know three o'clock so just in two long sentences what I surmised from this that 
all three speakers, the common themes going through was you really want us to recognize, identify and acknowledge the issues that exist in relation to systemic racism, discriminatory practices in both education and clinical practice. And these might advertently or inadvertently be fostered by our organizational culture. All three speakers highlighted the need for a collaborative approach to finding culturally competent solutions. This through a range from policy standards, process, allyship, and decolonization of the curriculum and the very environment in which we learn and practice. Um, I think what was coming out was it requires a whole system approach to cultural competence. Uh, I'm hoping I have surmised that <laughs> between the three of you. So I'm now going to hand over to Adalgo, who could perhaps direct some questions that have been appearing in the chat to the relevant speaker. But just to say that exactly at 523, I will call time and do some closing remarks, if that's okay with everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charmaine, and thank you to all three speakers. They were very, very amazing. So um, I'm just going to go through a few questions and I will pick who I think the question is best directed to. I don't think anyone got like a specific question, but if you feel like you have an answer to the question, then please, this is for the panelists, please just raise your hand and obviously give your insight on that as well. So the First question um, is how might we how might we work to reduce race inequity for our students on placement? I think that would best be directed to Kamini. I was thinking Chelsea might have a reflection on that as a current student, actually. Um, I mean, certainly for our uh, student members, uh, so I'm Chief Executive at the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists, so we're working to, to see what universities themselves are doing and encouraging them, as well as our practice placement providers, to look at how they uh, provide support to students when they're out on placement. We found that not all students are uh, supported in in a way that they should be and some of them are, are, are treated quite badly so it's really important that they are empowered to speak up so I think there's something about creating um, safety and space for students to say whether they when they feel that they're not being um, provided with the right sort of supervision and support but also ensuring that um, if you know what we can do proactively to support placements to provide them with the right sort of supervision from the outset and understanding that students may have needs, uh, religious needs uh, and cultural needs that should be respected. Um, I mean, I'm still shocked to this day that that's just not part of the norm, certainly was when I was an NHS manager, if I had staff from different and diverse communities. So I think that's, and that links back to, I think what he, Kian was saying about other, uh, what's happening within the NHS, because if students are going out into to, for placements in the NHS or social care, what's happening institutionally in those organisations that creates a, a positive culture, which is why we are looking to see what other uh, going back to Charmaine's points about other system leaders are doing. So NHS employers are responsible for things like HR policies within the system of the NHS, but we are doing what we can to influence in. But I don't know if, if Chelsea has a perspective on this. Um, I think um, it is, as, as a student in practice, um, I have seen from some of my cohort um members and other members of other students from around the country is that it's often they often find it really difficult as i said to to speak up but it's important that we do and so having um as Kamini said, a safe space to be able to raise these issues. Um, every uh, week we have at my university, we kind of have like a, a decompression session before we start our lectures. And so we can kind of talk about and share our experiences and also ask for advice um, from our teaching staff. Um, because sometimes it's difficult to kind of approach um, clinicians in practice about kind of sensitive issues and so they can kind of provide us with support and then uh, we can go back to our place of practice feeling that we have you know someone who will back us up and someone who will support us if we want to kind of pursue raising issues further. 
Thank you. Another question, Adelga? Yes. Um, just before I go on to the next question, how about I say the question and the speakers can put your hand up if they want to answer the question, or, you know, because the questions are quite general. So it's hard for me to pinpoint who I think would best answer it. Um, so the next one is, how can we measure that cultural competency is occurring within academia and healthcare? It's a bit of a tricky one. <laughs> okay, Kamini? Okay, so we're very keen to support members to look at how they measure impact and outcomes for their service users. So I mentioned the audit that we've provided for members to look at this at a service level. Separately, we, we've got an online tool for supporting the measurement of outcomes for patient care. So I think there's something about to start with, as I said, about more strategic work around are you actually meeting the needs of your populations that you serve? Are they visible in your caseloads? If they're not, what are you going to do to address barriers? So I think there is a way of helping people to measure at that level um, of looking at populations served. In terms of cultural appropriateness, um, it's really important that we then say, okay, so if you're if we're providing you with this guidance and this resource, how are you able to use it and implement it? And how does that link to improved outcomes? But also we have a really strong focus on co-production with our service users. So, you know, I think this is stuff that we will still be working with and through. So I think it's a really great question, actually. Um, and as somebody who's worked in uh, very, very uh, you know multicultural areas and I'm now working with our members directly to share some of my experiences to say well how are you outreaching to communities how are you engaging directly with communities so I think this is something that we should learn together on as well because many of the families we serve we all meet if that makes sense you know we're part of a, a, a an MDT but uh, so thank you for raising that really important I don't know if Kian wants to take that up in terms of academia yeah, I think one of the challenges uh, in terms of cultural competence is that sometimes some students feel like it's like a, you know, tick, tick, tick. And really, you can't do that because in some ways, this is like a long, a lifelong journey. And you need to just continually just engage with the learning and finding out and asking questions, asking questions of yourself. And I think we, what we really want to do is just uh, encourage whether it's clinicians or students to really look at the person that you have in front of you and use them as the experts in terms of telling you about what their reality is and if they are from someone from a minority group or group very different from you then even more so use the opportunity to learn from them and to as as it has been said before to kind of work together in partnership to kind of make sure that whatever you are planning as an intervention or as an assessment actually it actually captures uh, what's actually really important for the individual in terms of going forward in terms of making sure that whatever you do is not only meaningful <laughs> because you have to do something but meaningful that for them you know um, so I think there's lots lots you can do I think the other issue that's really important is to kind of be mindful of the power issue so a lot of cultural competence can happen without recognizing that there is a power dynamic. And so I think once you understand privilege and power, then it really helps you appreciate a little bit more about that process of uh, competence needs to include those elements too. So it's really important to have that conversation with your students, to have that with the educators um, and, and so on. Could I just come in there before you ask the next question, uh, just to go back to the question that was actually asked was how do we measure cultural competency and uh, Kamini told us about practice. Uh, just to add, you know, to what Kian is saying, uh, that another way that we can all have a real voice in making sure that education is held accountable for this is through uh, our, our professional standards. Uh, 
uh, you know, all our professional standards should be mapped against cultural competency, which is then reflected in the curriculum. And that's where people like Chelsea come in to be able to, what Kian was saying, to be able to tell us whether we've got it right or wrong. But additionally, every university has got their own quality assurance mechanisms. And that is a way of making sure that the curriculum is reflective of what the standards want it to be. So I think those are ways in which you can continue to, you know, it's a journey, but I think we've started. I think it would be wrong to say we haven't started, but it's about keeping up the momentum and certainly discourses such as this one certainly mm. help. And I'll go back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Charmaine. Um, so I'll just say really quickly if we don't get through all the questions. I'm really sorry, um, just because we are running tight on time. So for the next question, unconscious bias training has been a mainstay of training around inclusion and diversity. Is there still a place for this kind of training or can it do more harm through surfacing stereotypes? Hmm. Very, very good question. Kamini, do you want to kick off as a chief exec? Yeah, um, well, uh, it, we have had mixed feedback about this from our university colleagues. So some university colleagues have said exactly that, that they're not sure how useful it is. I've, I'm not sure exactly what the content of the training is that they've been on. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess there's something about what are the objectives here. You know, it's, it's about sort of thinking around how people make assumptions about you. I mean, people make assumptions about me all the time. I can, I bet you can imagine, you know, about what I might do or what I might not do in my role uh, or the fact I might not be actually who I am. So I think there's, you know, it's it's really about the content. So as I said, so it would be interesting, I guess, for universities who are using that sort of approach to look at whether what what the the um, those who've who've been on that course what they've actually learned and how it's changed the way they approach their thinking and I don't know having not done it myself I don't know if any of you have had that training and and experienced it but certainly we've had a mixed view on it. Um, I mean, I can certainly feed back from my university perspective. Uh, you know, like all all good organisations in terms of trying to be culturally competent. Uh, you know. Uh, Unconscious bias is mandatory uh, for all uh, members and especially if you are going to sit on any recruitment panels, be that for staff or for students. And the experience is exactly as Carmeny you've highlighted, it's a mixed bag. Uh, I do know people who perhaps it's more useful for people who the concept might be rather new to them. And that might sound surprising to uh, participants on this call, uh, but the concept can be quite new. Uh, I'm not quite sure how much it progresses the agenda in terms of for some of us who are maybe more tried and tested. I think that's my personal view on it. I think it's too neatly packaged to allow challenging i can do see chelsea nodding it's um to allow for challenging discourses that need to be had if you are really trying to decolonize an environment and an organization uh, but this is i'm not representing council's view here i'm just contributing as you know an equal participant in the conversation so just a final point on that. I mean, our members have talked about having uncomfortable conversations and actually that's really important. So, you know, yeah. there's a risk, isn't there, of it being too Absolutely. Easy. Um, and having uncomfortable conversations is something that I think we've started as a profession, which is, is a really good thing. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think we've got, uh, we've got about six minutes, Adalgo, so maybe time for a couple of questions. Yeah, I think we still have a, a few minutes. Um, so the next question is, is mentoring underrepresented staff not centering the deficit on them rather than where it needs to be on the leadership with reverse mentoring? Great question. Do any of our panel want to take that? Or I've got a little bit of experience with this one. Shall uh, I kickstart us and then you can yeah, come in? Yeah. 
Sure. It's, it's a really, really valid point. And I do think that I'm not quite sure I would be as bold as to say that uh, mentoring is based on a deficit model. However, I do recognize that when we say our BME staff or underrepresented uh, groups uh, you should encourage, you know, we should uh, be providing mentoring and coaching, for example. And by the way, I have uh, in my research, I have got evidence to say that that is what people do want. Um, but there is that issue of are you making the individual the, from the underrepresented group the problem? And that should not be the case. And I, it took me a while to get around that, but I totally agree. And I think what reverse mentoring, for those of you, I don't know if you're au fait with the concept, um, I certainly know the, uh, you know, one of the pioneers of reverse mentoring uh, in uh, the UK education system, uh, Stacey Johnson from the University of Nottingham, uh, you know, she's doing a lot of work with reverse mentoring. And basically, it is saying that should senior staff be mentored, for example, by a B, you know, BME or BAME colleague, so that they have the opportunity to walk in your shoes, so to speak. And that maybe changes the dynamics of mentoring where the underrepresented group does not become the deficit. So I think that is really uh, the focus. I don't know how many of you are au fait with reverse mentoring, but certainly uh, I know at uh, council it is something that uh, we have heard quite a lot about. I don't know if you find that useful. I hope you do. I, th I think reverse mentoring is, is uh, quite a huge, uh, helpful concept, but I think it doesn't take away the fact that actually for particular individuals who might be coming from particular backgrounds, having a mentor who is from a similar background is actually particularly helpful because sometimes it's really difficult to negotiate uh, the, you know, the kind of challenges ahead of you. And sometimes you don't quite know why you're getting, you're finding it so difficult. And that mentor who's gone through that process themselves can actually guide you in terms of, it may be even pointing you to the kind of uh, right kind of support or training or schemes that you can get involved in to kind of help you uh, get to the next step. And I think if you can get a mentor that can, uh, who has got, a similar background or experience and they can guide you I think that's very valuable and I think that should be you know um, discounted in some ways. No absolutely not I, I agree. Chelsea any comments on that as a final? I just wanted to kind of um, continue with what uh, Kian just, um, just said just now and uh, one of the reasons why I even applied for the leadership program was because of a black student midwife before me who had done the program and knew how good it was and similar to me she was kind she kind of found her voice while she was like kind of progressing through her course and it took her on a, a journey that she didn't expect at all and it was one of those things where you know you can't be what you can't see and if if I didn't see how she did and she didn't see before her see how someone else did, neither of us would have ended up on this program, uh, which has been such a huge, huge help to so many students who may not have even considered applying to anything like this. So I think having mentorship in any kind of shape or form, particularly for students who are underrepresented is, is a huge, huge plus. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm clock watching, and I think in Dalgo, that's probably a good time to, uh, you know, um, just give everyone some time to reflect on everything we have spoken about. Um, 
I want to say a huge thank you to Kamini, to Kian, and to Chelsea for your passion, for your time, for your very clear articulation, and certainly giving all of us some food for thought. And certainly I've made some points that I would like to take through uh, the anti-racism advisory group. So thank you so much for that. Uh, just for participants to be aware that we will be conducting a poll uh, just to, you know, for you to be able to share with us if you thought this session was valuable. I think um, getting your feedback is really important at the moment because, A, I've told you this is, you know, we're all privileged. We kicked off uh, Race Equity Month. Um, but, you know, if, if Race Equity Month is something that's of value to all of us in healthcare, then it is something the council would like to run you know, uh, year on year if, if, if it is considered appropriate. So that would be great. Um, we've talked a lot about leadership today and especially for underrepresented groups. So I'm, um, you know, just letting, reiterating to everyone on this call that remember the Council of Deans for Health has opened up a brand new fellowship scheme uh, where the applications opened on the 1st of November and if my memory serves me right close on the 21st of November. Um, I would really advise you to look at the council website and see if that applies to you. We would welcome your applications and Adalgo unless I've missed anything you can have I missed anything? No, I don't think you missed Lovely. anything. Very well done. Okay. Um, perhaps in which case, I'm just going to wait for a final. If there is anyone with an absolutely burning question that we cannot leave the webinar without answering it, because now I'm three minutes ahead of time. Hey, look, this is the way the world works. Um, but if I can't see anything, then uh, I can see the poll has just come up. I'm going to say thank you to each and every one of you for your participation and for helping us take what is, you know, what is a really important agenda for us in our com contemporary world uh, forward. My huge thanks to Council, as ever, for hosting uh, the event and to Adalgo for facilitating behind the scenes. Thank you very, very much. Um, and on that note, I will leave you until we meet the next time. Thank you ever so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.